Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. And as we're starting to kick off Holy Week, um, you'll get notifications if you haven't already that are in the emails. Uh, today begins the march toward Jerusalem for Jesus. So we begin our day with our early morning communion service. And then what we're going to do is I will bless the elements. And then I will ask the deacons to come up. They will administer the elements to me. I, in turn, will administer it to them. And then I do a blessing on each of you if you want it. And I'll come over here in front of the uh, communion table. So if you would like a blessing, then I certainly do it. If you don't, just cross your hands and you can move on. But take your little cup. Uh, we had a little confusion last time. Take the cup with you and bring it over there and give it to Joan, who will, will be picking them up. So as we begin today, let us begin with a moment of prayer before we start our service. Gracious God, we thank you again for all that you have done for us, for the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, but most of all, for the gift of eternal life you give us through him. And as we gather here today to honor that, we praise you and thank you, offering you this prayer and the prayer that Jesus taught the faithful when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are reminded that on the night in which Jesus did was betrayed, he took the bread and he blessed and broke it, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, he took the cup after he had suffered. He said, This cup is the new covenant which is in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us be in a spirit of prayer at this time. <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, we ask for your blessing upon these elements that they may be to us the body and the blood of Christ. And that in receiving them, we receive you. And that in receiving you, we receive the free and unwarranted gift of life eternal through Christ Jesus our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. So I'll ask the deacons to come forward at this time. This time I invite everyone to come forward in the spirit of prayer as we bless our, our tongues. O God, who in Jesus Christ triumphantly entered Jerusalem, 
heralding a week of pain and sorrow. Be with us now as we follow the way of the cross. In these events of defeat and victory, you have sealed the closeness of death and resurrection, of humiliation and exaltation. We thank you for these branches that promise to become for us symbols of martyrdom and majesty. Bless them and us, that their use this day may announce in our time that Christ has come and that Christ will come again. Amen. Come, praise Jesus. Amen.
mother and father in law on the show. And Barbara, it was your is Eric and Beverly. Beverly. Okay. Let's keep those people in our prayers during our prayer time. And as we begin, we begin with a reading taken from Psalm 118. <clears throat> and today we are being taped, so I welcome all of our viewers in TV land. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them, and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank thee that thou hast answered me, and hast become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech thee, give us success. Blessed be he who enters in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> we bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is good. He has given us light. Bind the festival pr procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will give thanks to thee. Thou art my God, I will extol thee. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. <clears throat> this is just it, dear Lord. Your love is unconditional, and it does endure forever. No matter how far we have wandered, and we continue to wander from you, nations and people. In our own lives, we have looked the other way when we should have looked toward what was going on. Yet no matter what we have done or left undone, or said or left unsaid, you are always there to guide us and direct us through this steadfast love, which finally culminates next Sunday with the death of your Son and his resurrection, which guarantees for all of us eternal life. We praise you and thank you for this gift and ask that you help us to be worthy of it. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join with me in our use and prayer of invocation. <clears throat> Almighty God, we love you, for you have turned your ear to us and heard our voice and our cries for mercy. The snares of death have encompassed us, and the horrors of the grave closed in upon us. We were filled with fear and anxiety. Then we called to you, O Holy Sovereign. We beg you to save us, and you who are merciful and good compassionate and kind, deliver us from death by the gift of your Son, Jesus, who, for our redemption, descended from the highest heaven, and took upon him our flesh to bear our sins and sorrows, and setting his face steadfastly to the place of his suffering, willingly for us came under the power of death. We praise you, O Lord of life and glory, that you have desired to come meek and lowly to the throne of our hearts. Help us to be worthy of such a gift as we now walk on your side in this land of the living. Holy Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Our hymn of adoration is hymn number 291, Thine is the Glory. <laughs>
us our truth, that if we come before him and confess our sins, he will indeed forgive us of our sins and restore us to right relationship with him. So at this time, please join with me in our unison prayer of confession. O God, most high, who dwells in light and accessible and full of glory, we bow ourselves down in your holy presence, confessing our sins many and grievous. Too often we have turned from the truth of your word to the false lights of this world. We have been blind and deaf to the signs that lead to righteous living. We have willingly followed the path of temptation and have sought the rewards of this life, ignoring the loneliness of your Son and the lasting pleasures and glories of his kingdom. Lord, have mercy and deal with us not as we deserve, but according to your loving kindness, forgive and absolve us of all our sins, and give us the grace and strength to walk henceforth in your holy ways. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here now the assurances of God's love and of God's forgiveness is recorded in the Gospel of John, where it is written, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but the world might be saved from him. We need to remember this, dear Lord, that your offer of salvation is not extended to just a few, but to many. Like the shepherd who went looking for the lost sheep, you are not satisfied with simply bringing 99 home safely, but for bringing all of us back into your kingdom, no matter where we are, what we've done, and no matter what faith we have come from, to come to you. For there are many ways to scale along. We thank you for this great gift of Christ, for it is in his name that we pray. Amen. And please stand and join with me in the Lord of God. Thank you.
We bring before you these gifts. They are but our tithes and our offerings, symbols of our life and of our labor. And we ask that you take them and use them, and take us and use us for the spreading of your gospel and the work of your church, both here and throughout the world. This we pray in Jesus' most holy name. Please be seated. <clears throat> and as you remain seated, would you join with me in our call of prayer? Jesus, grant that after having worshipped and confessed you on earth, we might be among the number of those who shall proclaim your eternal triumphs and bear in our hearts the palms of victory, where every knee shall bow before you, and every tongue confess that you are Lord, King of kings, and the glory of heaven, from whom abides dominion, power, glory, and honor, now and forever. Holy God, who sees the pain and suffering that reign in this passing world, have mercy upon all who suffer in mind and body. Look down with pity upon the poor, the oppressed, the outcast, and all who are heavy laden with care, astray in sin, or tormented by an accusing conscience, and give them peace. Especially this week, we raise our voices in prayer to the people in Ukraine who have lost loved ones, homes, livelihood, and life. May you defend them and give them aid in their time of need, and reassure that such deeds will not go unpunished. For as you have promised as far back in the book of Deuteronomy, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. In due time their foot will slip, the day, their day of disaster is near, and their doom rushes upon them. Give ear to these prayers, and do the prayer concerns and joys we raise before you this morning, for they are offered in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. So many other people in the world do not have the advantage of worshiping freely. No matter what goes on around our country, let us count our blessings, dear Lord, for all that you will give us. We pray this day especially for Eric and for Beverly, prayers of healing, both suffering from cancer. We pray for the Yahtzee family for the loss of two of their own this past week. Praying thanks for the Rileys being back in church and for Phyllis Draghi being back with us and Terry Merrick and for all those who have come back after times away for one reason or another, either travel or COVID. We would ask your Lord for your continued blessing upon us that we seek to do your will in this place and at this time. Here are our prayers for those mentioned and those not and those remembered and those not. As well as the prayer that Jesus taught the faithful when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is When I Surveyed the Wondrous Cross in number 258.
Our second reading comes from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, and that's on page 1023, if you'd like to follow along. Have this mind among yourselves, which you have in Christ Jesus, who taught, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equally with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has wholly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Our Gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 19 verses 28 through 40. And if you'd like to follow along in your pew Bibles, it is on page 913. And when he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount, which is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has needed it. So those who were sent went away and found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, and they said, the Lord has needed it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their garments on the colt, they set Jesus upon it. And as he rode along, they spread their garments on the road. As he was now drawing near at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. May God bless these readings and bless our understanding of them. Always to his glory. Amen. Let us be in the spirit of prayer at this time. Lord, as we witness your rejection by the religious and secular authorities, the hatred of the crowd at your cross, and even the betrayal of your own disciples, we confess our own many cowardly betrayals of you. Each of us in our own ways have played a part in the world's rejections of you. Sometimes the world has turned from you due to the lack of witness we have provided. The world has looked at us and the way we live our lives, what we value, the things we say and do toward our neighbors, and has rejected you because of us. At other times, when the world has followed its own way of power, oppression, and greed, we have, much to our disgrace and shame, been led by the ways of the world, rather than follow your way of love and justice. For all the ways we have rejected you, even the times we are unaware of our rebellion, remember again that you are a God of love and mercy, and be pleased, we ask, to forgive us. Dear Lord, we beseech you not to give up on us, but as befits your nature to keep reaching out to us in love, even when we turn away from you, and keep calling us to follow you, even when we diverge from your path. All that we might walk this holy week with you, more closer to you, and our faith strengthened by you. Keep coming to us, Lord, that we might better come to you. Father, as we ready ourselves for the word spoken, Remove from us all distractions of mind, the guilt we carry, and the pain we bear, that we might find spiritual nourishment in this message. Bless this sermon and all that is true to the glory of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. From the beginning, 
from the time of the fall when Eve and Adam ate of the fruit of the garden. In other words, when all humanity willfully disobeyed the Almighty, God has been working in our redemption. Though it has been a long and drawn out process, whose plan and timetable are known only to God and to God alone, the Holy One, blessed be He, revealed that the conclusion of His plan was to be witnessed in the life death and resurrection of his son. Jesus was a divine sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice, one in which God, knowing that humanity could never repay the sin it had committed against him, sacrificed to himself. The first step in this reconciliation is traceable in the Gospel account today. As two processions approach Jerusalem, what we are observing is a conflict of cataclysmic proportions. From the west came Pilate, draped in the glory of imperial power. The Romans were the masters of the world, and their army was second to none. Horses, chariots, and gleaming armor announced to all the might of Rome. On fear of death or reprisal, there were few who dared go against the Roman authority. But those who did, death on a cross, the most horrific of executions in the ancient world, awaited them. From the east came another procession, a ragtag group, followers of a little-known rabbi from Nazareth. Lacking the polish and discipline of a professional army, this group wore cloth and not armor, carried no weapons, walked and did not march in formation, and most importantly sought to worship God and not dominate the landscape and its people through acts of violence, terror, and intimidation. Still, it was a conflict in the making. The forces of the world represented by the Romans, with all its emphasis on the tangible, of money and power, of that which can be measured and felt, pitying themselves against the world of the Spirit represented by Jesus, that which cannot be measured or felt, or even seen, the world that can only be known through faith. The opening scene is one filled with meaning and symbolism that those in the crowd who knew of such things could well recognize. It is significant that Jesus approaches Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, the spot where tradition held that the Messiah would appear. Ahead of, ahead of him, he sends two disciples to act as an advance guard. It is a practice Jesus has employed as far back as when he sent the disciples out to go and preach to each town, preach a sermon of repentance. The two disciples, who remain unnamed, are to enter the village ahead of him, and in all likelihood this village is but page, and retrieve a colt on which no one has ever sat. In other words, the colt is one that has not been put to secular use. If anyone is to question the colt is being taken, the disciples are to answer, the Lord has need of it. As such, Jesus is identifying himself as Israel's Lord, who needs and proposes to fulfill his mission, his chosen mission. And these needs are greater than any human concern. The unnamed disciples do as they are instructed, and sure enough, as they are untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. The repetition, serving again to highlight the importance of the event. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their garments on the colt, they sat Jesus upon it, and as he rode along, they spread their garments on the road. While the spreading of garments upon the, G upon the path Jesus is taking was meant as a token of honor, it is a practice that dates back approximately to 841 B.C. when Jehu was proclaimed king in the second book of Kings. The writing in on a cult would remind the crowds of the words recorded by the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king came to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fall of a donkey. 
as he is now drawing near at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had been seeing. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, praise in heaven and glory in the highest. In short, the disciples praised God using the same words that were used when Israel crowned a new king. The crowds are exuberant, energetic, excited, high-spirited, and cheerful, and for good reason. On the one hand, that Jesus fulfills what the prophets before him have said. On the other hand, his acts and the events in his life fulfill what he has said. Still, despite witnessing some of Jesus' mighty works, miraculous signs and wonders, this crowd, which at the moment cannot restrain its delight, will in but a few days observe their mighty king hanging from a cross, wearing the crown of thorns, and mock this king of the Jews. What has happened? Are the crowds so fickle? Or are they just intimidated by the might, power, and ruthlessness of the Roman legions. I believe there's a third option, namely that in their enthusiasm to embrace Jesus, they have failed to recognize the meaning of the prophetic signs that have announced his arrival. Put another way, they, like their Roman overlords, have not been able to distinguish between world and spirit. In short, this group of followers is reveling in the belief that the long-awaited Messiah would be a warrior king, one who, using the means and resources of this world at his disposal, would throw off the yoke of the Roman oppressors and restore Israel to the greatness it had not known since the time of King David, when he reigned between 1010 and 970 B.C. And nothing is farther from the truth. Blinded as they were by the hope that a military solution would institute a time of prosperity, those in the crowd would later turn, who would later turn on and from Jesus have failed to recognize the true meaning of the signs, seeing only what they wish or what they hope to see. For example, when Jesus enters Jerusalem riding on a colt, reminding the people of the passage in Zechariah 9.9, take note that the triumphant king comes as a humble and peaceful monarch. Evidenced most dramatically by his riding on a donkey, an animal of peace, and not on a horse, an animal of war. Even now, the world continues to the sin of Adam by seeking to take the place of the Almighty, in effect becoming its own God, which we witness most clearly in communist countries and in dictatorships. Since Russia has dominated the news so much, I would draw your attention to Russia before the Soviet Union. Ruled by the Romanov family for over 300 years, Russia was a deeply religious country. In fact, the Romanovs and the church often worked together, the Tsars believing that they had, been, they had both ruled by the will of God and were subject to the will of God. All this would change after the murder of the Tsar and his family, on Wednesday, July 17, 1918, which ended the rule of the Romanovs and put the Bolsheviks in power. During the Soviet era, over 100,000 Christian churches, around 20,000 Muslim mosques, 500 Buddhist temples, and 1,400 synagogues were destroyed. In addition, over 450,000 priests and millions of believers were killed. From the Civil War of 1917 to 1922 and onward, churches and monasteries were raided by order of another Vladimir, not Putin, but Vladimir Lenin. And the Communist Party sold off property and valuables worth billions of rubles for almost nothing to buyers abroad. By eliminating, condemning, and outlawing any worship of God through intimidation, threat, terror, arrest, torture, the state sought to refashion people's loyalties, to disconnect people from that which they held most dear. When what is most important is taken from our lives, is stripped from us, taken away, we seek something to fill the void. 
Those in power alone knew this. And stepping into the vacuum left the people with no alternative but to worship the state. In effect, Russia became a godless country. This is by far not a new phenomenon. Two years after his assassination, on March 15, 44 BC, Julius Caesar was formally deified, made a god, by being declared the divine Julius. His adopted son Octavian, better known as Augustus, a title given to him 15 years later in 27 BC, thus became the son of the divine Julius, or simply the son of God. Early in his reign, Halley's Comet passed over Rome. Augustus claimed that it was the spirit of Julius Caesar entering heaven. If Caesar was a god, then as his heir, Augustus was the son of a god. And he made sure that everyone knew it. Since he personally owned a fifth of the wealth of an empire that accounted for about 30% of the gross domestic product of the whole world, Augustus, the first emperor of the Roman Empire, amassed a net worth by today's calculations of a staggering $4.6 trillion. Despite this great wealth, and even his claim of divinity, Augustus Caesar and all those who have come after him, up to and including the rulers of today, those who seek to be gods in their own right, do not ever seem to realize that the things of this world are fleeting. Though they might wage war, conquer countries, and imprison people like the Romans in Jesus' time and the Russians in our time, the one thing the world and its leaders cannot offer is salvation. As the psalmist declares, with the Lord on my side I do not fear, what can man do to me? In like manner the prophet Isaiah proclaims, the Lord Almighty is the one to, to be regarded as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. Jesus echoes this sentiment when he says, And fear not them that will kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey to show that the Messiah was contrary to what people came to believe or to expect. He was not a man of war, but a man of peace. Not one who sought to conquer hearts by force, but by love. His presence announced to the kingdoms of this world that their strength was but an illusion, their power fleeting, and their empire short-lived. In contrast, as Jesus will later declare to Pilate, my kingship is not of this world. In effect, saying that it is eternal and not temporal, everlasting and not momentary, boundless and not finite. Consequently, it logically follows that his kingdom is not of this world, neither is his power. While the Romes and the Russias of this world may control lives for a season, Jesus ensures life for eternity. While the rulers and dictators and tyrants and the despots seek to control and manipulate all aspects of life, they cannot enslave the soul. For the psalmist says, our God is a God of salvation, and to God, the Lord, belongs escape from death. And for that, let the people answer and say, Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 248, Hosanna, loud Hosanna.
today to face the joys and the challenges that this week will surely bring. Leave here with the promise of Christ in your hearts and upon your minds. When he said, I am the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Go in the peace of Christ.